So hi everyone, my name is Shaylee Rosen. I'm a team leader for Groundbreaking Israel, um, a program from Israel 21C. I'm a team leader of the World Aid team and we are having a presentation today from Israel Aid and United Hatzalah to talk about the inspiring work that they do all over the world. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and let's see if everybody can see it. So, so um, this event is about inspiring organizations providing humanitarian aid from Israel. Um, we are looking to show some background information um, about this kind of work, about humanitarian aid, um, mostly through logistics and the whys and the hows of how they do their work and why they do their work. This meeting is going to take place um, in the order of events are introductions, um, an interview period, then an audience question and answer period, as well as closing. Um, this event will be recorded um, for people to see that weren't able to come. So just be aware that this is being recorded. So Israel Aid um, was founded in 2001 as a coalition of Israeli organizations working in disaster relief and international development. Israel Aid has grown into an independent NGO and the largest humanitarian aid organization in Israel. Its mission is to support people affected by humanitarian crises by partnering with local communities around the world to provide urgent aid, assist in recovery, and reduce the risk of future disasters. From earthquakes and hurricanes to epidemics and forced displacement, Israel Aid has been at the forefront of responding to major humanitarian crises worldwide. It has worked in more than 50 countries, supporting millions of program beneficiaries and at one time and any one time has around 300 staff members worldwide. United Tala of Israel is the largest independent nonprofit fully volunteer emergency medical service organization that provides the fastest and free emergency medical first response throughout Israel. United Hatzalah's service is available to all people regardless of religion, race, or national origin. United Hatzalah has more than 6,200 volunteers around the country available around the, around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. With the help of our of their unique um, GPS technology and their iconic ambulances, their average response time is less than three minutes across the country and 90 seconds in metropolitan areas. Their mission is to drive to arrive at the scene of medical emergencies as soon as possible and provide patients um, with professional appropriate medical aid and ambulances arrive um, resulting in many more lives saved. So representing is your aid is Rachel Sontag Bloom. Um, she's joining us today to share more about Israel's mission, methodologies, and global programs, as well as be the bridge um, building impact, oh, and as well as the bridge, the bridge building impact of this life changing humanitarian work. Rachel joined Israel Aid in 2019 and currently serves as a resource development director with the Israel Aid US team based in Los Angeles. She's traveled to Israel Aid's Guatemala field mission in 2019 following the eruption of Volcano de Fuego and in 2020 deployed with Israel Aid as part of its COVID-19 emergency response to food insecurity um, in the Southern California region. She brings over a decade of experience working in the nonprofit sector at a variety of communal medical and philanthropic organizations. Prior to joining Israel Aid, Rachel served in various development and community engagement role, professional roles um, at Jewish World Watch, Sinai Temple, and USC Keck School of Medicine in Los Angeles. Rachel first got her start in philanthropic sector at California Community Foundation, where she supported civic engagement programs by to LA's diverse populations, focused on immigrant integration, early childhood education, and community development issues. She is an alumni of University of Southern California with, um, with concentrations in political science and nonprofit management. Representing United Hetzela is Gavi Friedson. Uh, he's the Director of International Emergency Management and Global Ambassador. Um, Gavi Friedson has been saving lives since the age of 15. Over the course of 19 years on the job, Friedson has distinguished himself more than 10,000 emergency calls, ranging from acute medical crises to multiple casualties and catastrophic events. He has been first medic on the scene at a number of terrorist attacks during his years as a first responder. Having spent most of his life volunteering with Israel's rescue agencies, he returned to the United States in 2017 to help expand United Rescue's operations for international cooperation, responsible for helping to identify additional locations and emergency programs and development. Gabriel has been to several disasters to provide humanitarian aid, including Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. 
In 2022, he assisted with medical rescue flights, helping evacuate Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees to Israel. Gavriel Friedson served as in the elite Nahal Infantry Brigade um, and later in the spokesperson unit of the IDF. He holds a BA in communications from Reichman University, IDC, and a master's degree in public health specializing in emergency and disaster management from Tel Aviv University. So welcome, Rachel and Gavi. We're so excited to have you. Um, and let me stop sharing my screen. One second, sorry about this. So welcome. We're so excited to have you and hear about the amazing work that your organization does. So as mentioned, um, we are going to be speaking about the background kind of information, um, talking about the work that both Israel Aid and Unit Hatsala does in terms of logistics and the whys and hows of their work. So um, the way that this part of the meeting is going to be taking place is um, it's going to be a question and answer from me um, to both Rachel and Gavi. And any questions you have, feel free to put in the chat um, and we will get to them during the question and answer period following this. So um, just a general question for both of you, Rachel, you can start with this and the Gavi, you will follow. Um, what led your organization to provide humanitarian aid? Uh, great question. I always love the origin story. Uh, first off, I just wanted to say hello to all of you, and I'm so happy to be speaking with you and sharing the work of Israel and with Gavi. Um, it takes all hands on deck, especially now with, you know, all of the crises that we're facing around the world in particular particularly in Ukraine. So it's wonderful to have you all here and to be among like minds. So Israel uh, got started, as mentioned, um, approximately 20 years ago when we actually started as a small um, group of Israelis, idealistic Israelis who had just gotten out of the army and were traveling and realized that they had a lot of resources and skills post army uh, to be able to help around the world. And what started as kind of a small cluster of individuals has grown over the past 20 years to a humanitarian aid organization um, that receives funding from the UN to you know, multitude of different types of funding agencies around the world and has really professionalized over the years. So it's been incredible to see the growth from sort of this small entity to something that has grown into what we know today as a formal uh, international NGO. That's very amazing to hear. Gavi, how about you with United Hatella? Great, so again, uh... It's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for the uh, opportunity, not just for Israel, but for United Sala, two great organizations who are really on the front lines um, at disasters all over the world, and especially with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, it was a natural fit for United Sala. So United Sala is Israel's largest uh, fully volunteered uh, non-for-profit uh, medical first response organization. We respond to emergencies within three minutes or less. That's our priority on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but when it comes to kind of expanding beyond the borders of Israel, uh, we've actually had three chapters in Ukraine, uh, one in Kiev, one in Oman, and one in Odessa. So it's actually a natural fit. And that's why United Hatzalah was uh, able to be the first international medical organization with a field hospital with 150 medics on the border of Moldova because of our connections in Ukraine, which we'll get into a little bit later of how that assisted us. But that's kind of one of the reasons that actually helped us uh, in those first moments and the first, real the first three days of when the invasion first started over two months ago, uh, choose Ukraine and, and, and made us get involved. But we did not think we'd get involved as much as we did until we got there and realized how uh, how horrific the whole problem was and, and how it's just growing. So um, again, amazing, incredible work that both you guys do through your organizations. Um, I know that both your organizations are primarily volunteer based. So um, one of the questions that we wanted to know was, um, how do you guys go about this? Like, what is your process for training people that are volunteering in your organization? Um, we can go with the same order as before. <laughs> Yeah, as I mentioned, as Israel is, or Israel, excuse me, has, um, you know, grown, what started out as more of a volunteer base, we've actually focused more um, as we've grown on professionalizing our staff. So originally we started out as, you know, obviously Israelis who had different skill sets and our different sectors of expertise, um, everything from medical care to what we call protection, which may be psychosocial support, um, mental health support, um, 
sexual and gender based violence support in terms of you know helping individuals process trauma, as well as education and water sanitation and hygiene. And with those areas of expertise, as we've grown, we've recognized that there's a lot of need for more specialized skills um, in terms of having individuals who work professionally within those sectors. So as we've grown, while well, we also have opportunities for individuals who may want to um, you know, support communities in need, particularly in the US on the local level, what we found is that we've evolved over the past few years to professionalize our staff members. That being said, is we always have opportunities for individuals here in the US, if there is a US response that Israel's involved in, we currently have 16 around the world, 16 missions. Um, but in terms of volunteer base, um, we keep a roster of individuals with specialized skills in those areas. Most of them are deployed from Israel, um, but as we focus on longer term sustainability in the communities we operate, a lot of our hires um, tend to be more full time staff and operate on the ground in the countries we work in as well. That is incredible. Um, yeah, Gabby, how about you? Sorry about that. No, so in terms of United Sela, uh, our organization as of today, now we were that was 2006, as of today, we have about 6,200 uh, full uh, active, um, full-time around the clock volunteers. On top of the 6,200, we have several hundred more that are actually in courses, EMP courses, paramedic courses. Uh, of the 6,200 volunteers, um, we have doctors, EMTs, the majority are EMTs, but uh, we have hundreds of paramedics as well as doctors who, you know, go about their everyday life, work in whatever uh, job it is that they may be, whether it's a, a physician, a teacher, uh, working at the fish market, at the Shook, um, an educator, it doesn't matter. They do their everyday job. And on top of that, they're able to respond to any emergency within their neighborhood or where they work. Uh, when they want to. So our system's kind of based off of almost like Uber, where it finds the five closest drivers, we find the five closest medics. Now it's very possible if someone's working full time and is not able to respond at that given moment, whether a father's at home with his child or a mother's at home with his child, or they're on a date night or whatever it is, they don't have to respond. There's also ways to kind of uh, filter out uh, within the walkie-talkie, within the in the communication system, you can tell the dispatch that you're only available if there's a mass casualty or a terrorist attack or, or you know, someone's choking next door, where you can kind of, while you're volunteering, kind of still turn it off. Um, but we have 6,200 volunteers that are fully active, uh, many of them that participated in the Ukraine relief. And then of those 6,200, we also have a psychotrauma division, which uh, specializes in mental health aspects. Uh, foreign and abroad, uh, also uh, also domestic in terms of dealing with all of our medics. Um, you know, they see a lot of crazy things, especially with the terrorist attacks um, and being able to provide uh, that support and per try to prevent PTSD from occurring. Um, but these volunteers are 24-7. Are and then in certain areas, like just in where we were now on the Moldova border, uh, we had a lot of locals that came and helped us. And we also had a lot of volunteers uh, from the United States who decided to come uh, on their own dime, just come out there and join us. There's a doctor that was actually interviewed on CNN by Anderson Cooper about his amazing heroic efforts where he went behind enemy lines into Ukraine to ref, uh, rescue several babies. Uh, as we know, there's a lot of orphans in Ukraine. Um, so the emphasis though is the volunteer. Um, that is really the, the majority of our organization. That's incredible. I know that both your organizations do work where you guys respond um, to crises all over the world, um, especially like quick responses. Um, but it seems like also like Israel is more focused on long term response while United Hatzalah is focused on like the getting there quickly and making sure that there's emergency medical aid um, as fast as possible. Um, so it's very interesting, like um, looking at the differences between those organizations and how you guys do your work. Um, speaking on um, doing these kinds of like this kind of work. Um, what kind of logistics go into these kinds of missions? You can start this in order. Um, I guess I'll take this again. We can always switch around Gabby too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Israel, you know, while we are focused on the long term, we often see emergencies as sort of the entry point into responding to crises. Um, and it's the point in which we really understand there's a big difference between what is immediate needs um, in terms of an initial emergency, whether that's a humanitarian aid crisis um, in a physical sense, what's happening in Ukraine versus something like an earthquake or a hurricane. 
Um, and the needs kind of vary depending on the situation on the ground, obviously, what resources are available from the local governments, um, that sort of thing. But we see that entry point as our emergency response team will monitor crises around the world and determine by a variety of factors if there is a value added for Israel to go in. So there's a couple of series of questions and it's I'm gonna oversimplify it. It's a much more complicated internal process, but we're evaluating, you know, what are the areas of greatest need? Are Israel's um, sectors of expertise, as I mentioned, protection, education, uh, wash, water, sanitation, hygiene, and medical? Um, are those specific areas of expertise needed in that environment? And are those needs being met either by the local government, um, other NGOs, or also within an entire swath of space? Are there different communities outside of the primary um, location, such as the capital, that may need additional assistance? So as we go through that series of evaluation and determine that Israel does have a value added in those sectors, we'll deploy a small emergency response team to the location to do usually a two to three week evaluation. In the case of Ukraine, uh, we sent mental health experts, medical, um, and our emergency response team, which is more generalist, uh, to really get a sense on the ground and determined that there were particular areas in Moldova specifically, while there were a lot of aid organizations in Poland and also in Ukraine, that Moldova actually had a great need that wasn't being serviced by other um, international NGOs. So Israel's sort of approach is to really find, as I mentioned, the areas of most need, but also underserved. Um, and we were actually able to get up and running um, in Moldova, our emergency response team, fairly quickly, I think we deployed within three days of the initial crisis starting, um, and were able to create an infrastructure with the local government. And as more aid organizations have now arrived in Moldova, we've been able to serve as sort of a guiding um, community uh, partner in terms of helping other aid organizations navigate the specifics of Moldova. So we really see the operation. And obviously, as we determine different needs, we'll bring in more individuals from our Israel team, uh, depending on the specific needs on the ground, whether that's additional psychosocial support. In the case of Ukraine, obviously, it's primarily mothers and their children coming over the border. I believe it's something like 95% of the individuals are fitted within those categories and really tailoring our mental health support for those individuals specifically. Incredible work. Um, yes, like I, um, I know that like you guys do a lot of rapid responses also. Um, and so seeing that, like, especially in Ukraine, we have done an article on um, the work you guys did there. Like, it's incredible to see um, the work that you are still doing there um, and you have done. Um, and Gabi, how about with United Hatzala? Yeah, uh, logistics is a, uh... Uh, I could talk about that for an hour, right? I'm sure Rachel agrees with me. And logistics is everything, right? So when this first happened over two months ago, you know, again, we were kind of, I don't know if the right word is lucky, but we actually had the privilege of having our chapters that were already there that we could already work with and have kind of an infrastructure. But everything, it was a game changer for us because no one knew if we would even have access to those cities. And what does this mean? All of a sudden we're dealing under a war zone. Um, in terms of logistics, you know, even in Mayron, when that last year, when that there was that mass casualty um, collapse, structure collapse and um, stampede, you know, we also, in terms of logistics, we have a team of medics that was already there, kind of trying to be able to prevent certain things of having a, a medical onsite um, field hospital or field tent um, to provide any kind of, you know, situation that could occur. Now, in terms of with Ukraine, um, the logistics were a little bit more complex. We also, we sent out a team of uh, about a team of 12 paramedics, you know, senior, you know, uh, emergency disaster specialists who've been to other uh, disaster zones around the world that can kind of come in and identify what exactly are the needs. That's the most important thing. Now, when we got there, they got there and kind of reported back saying, wow, it's much more complex than we thought. And then literally the next day, we had an airplane of 150 medics arriving. Um, setting up a field hospital, food, blankets, uh, medication, uh, tents. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the refugees that came in over the border uh, were just very hungry and very cold. I mean, makes sense, right? They didn't really have a lot with them. And most people came with whatever they could take, that they could carry on their two hands and just run with. Um, so our job was really to try to provide stabilization 
um, and then work with you know the Israeli consulate or government officials who are able to then kind of figure out what can we do with them, who's going to go to Israel, and then slowly we started to end up chartering flights. So fast forward to now, we've had over 30 humanitarian charter flights. Uh, 15 of them were fully booked with just uh, refugees. Each flight had about 170 refugees, some time about 3,000 people that we've taken to Israel. On top of that, another 15 flights of just cargo and humanitarian relief and meals that we could prepare, especially over Passover, we had over 80,000 uh, kosher hot meals that were prepared just in, in on the Moldova border um, to serve that community. But in terms of the logistics, I'd say um, it, it is key to anyone's success in any organization, obviously, to figure out how you can get the medics in, how you can get them out, and then what obviously you do with the refugees once they come to Israel um, in terms of how do we get them there. Now, our job's obviously emphasis is on the medical side, uh, and then we work with different agencies in figuring out who comes to Israel on a 90-day, you know, tourist visa, or if they have family, they'll make Aliyah, um, but it's just the cooperation with all the other organizations on the ground. That's fantastic. That's really incredible. Um, so this time we'll reverse the order. Um, Gavi, you'll start. So how, um, like, what are the primary differences between the work that you do in Israel versus the work that you do abroad? Well, in Israel, we're full-time, you know, servicing the needs of any medical situation. So when someone here, let's say in the United States calls 911, um, you expect an ambulance to arrive, usually will come just like in Israel, anywhere between seven to 15 minutes, if you're lucky. Um, it's just too long, right? Seven to 15 minutes is great. It's a great way to transport a person to the hospital, but brain damage starts at three minutes, right? Three minutes or less, uh, especially if the person's uh, in cardiac arrest or in CPR, you need to stop the bleeding. You don't have 15, 20 minutes to wait if it's really a life-saving emergency. Um, so we're able to really get there within three minutes or less. Uh, and that's kind of our needs in Israel in terms of making sure that our response time is so fast, which really has become the fastest in the world. Most cases in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, you get there in 90 seconds. Um, it's different abroad because most of our efforts out of Israel um, are usually revolving around some sort of disaster, right? So we've been to Nepal, we've been to Haiti, the hurricanes uh, in 2017, uh, psychological response at the Surfside Miami collapse, uh, and as well as the active shooter situation in Pittsburgh with uh, the Tree of Life synagogue. So each case has its own kind of different scenario and the flow of events. And depending again, going back to logistics in terms of how many people are we going to send out, how many do we need a delegation of eight? Do we need a delegation of 15? Um, or maybe even 150, like as we, we just had on that first aircraft that left to Ukraine. Um, it really depends. And then obviously, we, depending on the situation and the crisis, is it a psychological, do we need you know 10 members of the psychological mental health team? Um, we also now have a, a canine team that actually is uh, work, works with the psychotrauma unit um, as a uh, as uh, pets, we have like I think two Labradors and two other uh, King Charles puppies that actually kind of help within the psychological aspect with kids, uh, in terms of you know dealing with their their uh, mental health aspects of of the tragedy. Um, so it really depends. But um, Israel, you know, we have to make sure that we're able to get to every emergency within three minutes or less. Um, and then when we go abroad, it's just a, a completely different ballgame. Yeah, I. Actually, we um, when preparing your about like your um, company, I saw the three minutes or less or the ninety seconds, and it made me do a double take. I like when you think about how it really is three minutes or less, and even ninety seconds, like that somebody will show up and be there for you. It's like it's almost unimaginable that like you can call somebody and then within ninety seconds or within three minutes, like they're there. Um, so it's really incredible work. Um, how about you, Rachel? Yeah, so Israel is really interesting um, in the sense that our actual mission and mandate is actually to work exclusively outside of Israel, which often surprises people as, you know, a humanitarian aid organization with ISRA in the name. Uh, people often assume that we do both global and local, but we really saw that development happen because there's some incredible aid organization, United Hatzlaha is one of them, that operate within Israel, and there's a ton of 
you know, civic organizations and passionate organizations working within the context of the, you know, conflict. And so Israel actually does not work specifically within Israel, Gaza, or um, the West Bank. We really see our mission as there's few Israeli organizations that are exporting Israeli expertise in the sectors that I mentioned outside to do long-term sustainable development work. So we really see our niche as focused on bringing that expertise to a much global, uh, a global platform. And as a result of that, I think there's multiple um, impacts from that. Obviously, first is a humanitarian aid aspect, which is first and foremost why we do what we do. But I think a natural output of that work, working in communities that may not have ever met an Israeli or a Jewish person, um, obviously our staff are not all uh, Jewish or not all necessarily Israeli even, but having that opportunity to build bridges and to see sort of the collective humanity of the individuals who are staff with Israel working in these communities really creates a, a very impactful um, outcome in terms of that bridge building work and also bringing communities together that would not normally interface. So yeah, within Israel, we, we don't operate, um, but obviously our primary recruitment of um, first responders and long-term sustainable professionals who are working in those sectors, um, working long-term um, are exported and often will stay on average between six to eight years at certain locations. Um, Haiti is actually an example, a perfect example. We were there for 10 years. And then with the recent um, earthquake happening last year, we actually were able to reactivate our team members who were on the ground in local hires there. So we really see sort of that, um, that aspect and, you know, utilizing the diversity of also Israel. Um, obviously, it's a country of, you know, immigrants from many different backgrounds. In our Ukraine response, we're actually able to capitalize quite a bit on our, um, you know, Russian population within Israel and actually have Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers actually deploy with the team who also had the sector expertise uh, to really serve on the ground in Moldova um, and now Romania to really help um, you know, compound the impact of the work that we're doing there, having the language, you know, capabilities and that sort of thing as well. That's really incredible. So actually that happens to be um, very similar to like the work that we do, obviously not in the medical field or um, with humanitarian responses, but um, at Israel 21C, we do show a lot about like trying to build bridges with people and show the amazing work that Israel and Israelis do around the world um, and just introduce people to stories that they don't really know about. Um, so it seems that like your organization does a lot of similar things, like introducing people to Israelis and people working within that field. Um, so this is more of a personal question, um, but of all the places that you've been, which um, like humanitarian response was the most impactful for you guys? Um, we could start in the same order with Gabi and then Rachel. Um, it's a great question. Every, every destination is so different, right? You know, we also spent twice we were in Haiti. Nepal, um, the United over you know different places I'd mentioned in the United States from uh, Pittsburgh to Surfside to Miami to the two hurricanes. I would say that I mean I got to participate in the hurricanes in 2017. Uh, actually started in Houston that first hurricane in Texas, and then a week later we were in Florida, and then right after those Puerto Rico. Um, those hurricanes were kind of an eye opener. I think it was more interesting being in the United States because when it first happened, everyone was like, why would Israel or anybody, you know, America, it's America, right? That's the last place that needs outside help. And it was so fascinating to actually be leading a team of 25 medics from Israel coming to the United States. And more than anything, it just felt, you know, we were the only country that actually came internationally to provide any assistance during that hurricane. And, um, it was a sense of pride, I think, just having the Israeli flag on your shoulder and being able to come and just say, even if there's nothing, at least we're there to, to help with something. And really, it was completely unknown. And it was such a successful mission. I remember, you know, not only Texas was so successful in terms of just the psychotrauma aid that we ended up providing. Uh, we, we had a whole team that had to go to the Dallas uh, uh, stadium where they were taking all the evacuees and it was just packed with thousands of people um, who needed shelter. And our psychotrauma unit was not only were they helping just, you know, everyday regular civilians and citizens of Dallas, but they were also helping um, no, really no crazy one. So, so we left off with um, what was the most inspiring or impactful event um, that you worked on. I know that um, you were saying about working in the States, 
Um, yeah. So we can continue from there. Yeah, I was just sharing a story of just like ending up in, you know, the Key West. And I've never been there. You know, it's a vacation spot. A lot of people like to go there. And when I was there, it felt like a scene from out of a movie where you like went to Universal Studios and you went on one of those rides that took you through a movie set of just absolute catastrophe. And um, and it was. I mean, every single power line was down. Trees were down. Boats were not in the ocean. were on people's homes, cars. Everything was just twisted upside down. And this was the United States, right? It just felt, you know, almost like a third world country. And our team was able to really find and locate um many people that were missing and we just worked as a team and we did it um and then even in Miami I'd say like the the love and, and the warmth that we got from the local fire department of Miami-Dade and just wanting to learn from the Israeli expertise um was really really amazing and so was Nepal like they're they just they just love the Israeli uh, expertise you know we're such a tiny country of nine million people and you know we're able to with organizations such as Israel and United Atzala um, it just makes that country even more special. And then they always say, you know, Israel shines light, you know, upon nations. And it really does. I mean, we get to actually be on the front lines of that um, in terms of really getting to take um, our volunteers and, and, and show the best of, of what Israel has to offer and inspire the other communities around the world to do that and learn from us. And ever since, there's been great partnerships that have grown from this um, and team trainings that we try to do once a year with other countries. Uh, so that moving forward, We'll have even better relationships uh, in case another disaster happens to strike in the near future. Michelle, have it with you. Yeah, so um, I'm actually sort of an interesting uh, example. I'm actually a development staff or, uh, member who I actually do primarily fundraising and business operations. So I'm not part of our humanitarian deployment team, um, but obviously working within the fundraising sector, um, I interface a lot with our donors and with our supporters here in the US. So for me, having an understanding of what things are like on the ground is a really important piece. I unfortunately had started about three months before COVID hit. So I've been a bit more limited in terms of my ability as a US staff member to deploy um, uh, to see the ground. I had some, you know, obviously some trips planned to Bahamas and Colombia, which ended up not happening in 2020. Um, but I was lucky enough within my first week of starting to actually visit our uh, mission in Guatemala, which has been a long-term uh, mission. I believe we're at five years now, a little bit under five. Um, and for me, that experience, I really want to share with you because one, it's one of my only, you know, international opportunities, but it was such an impactful trip in the sense that you know, Guatemala is a place that is actually rated one of the highest. Um, in the okay. um, so, uh, um, Ali, thank you. Sorry about that. All good. Um, and Guatemala was interesting um, because it's a country that often faces quite a bit of, uh, you know, natural disasters. It ranks really high as one of the most susceptible to natural disasters. Um, there's an international ranking. And it has faced multitude of different types of disasters. In this case, it was actually a volcano eruption that had decimated entire communities. So part of our trip going there was actually to meet with the team on the ground who had been working um, in these small towns uh, that basically had been completely displaced. People lost their homes, their schools, their hospitals. I mean, everything just completely wiped out within you know, literally seconds. Um, and we were actually able to meet with these individuals who had been affected by it. Um, Israel, Israel Aid sets up what we call child-friendly spaces or child-safe spaces, where it's a temporary shelter or eventually it'll turn into a long-term shelter, you know, in a community center. And we provide programming throughout the day for both the kids. And then as it transitions into the evening time, we'll actually do classes and resilience training for the parents. So it's really what we call wraparound care, both the education, the mental health support. And to be able to go into these locations and see the cohesiveness of the community that had been through so much, but yet were still so resilient and so hopeful because they had support and they felt that there were individuals who had traveled all the way from Israel um, to come there and help them rebuild, not just for the immediate crisis, but to help them rebuild in the long term. Um, for them was really, really important to feel that they weren't alone and to be able to be witness to that sort of 
support that Israel is able to provide and see the relationships that are formed with the communities and see the love and care that our staff show to the individuals, but also reciprocally having our staff help train locals and having those locals be empowered to reserve their community as well really is about the work that we do. It's about the long-term sustainability. It's about empowering communities and partnering communities to rebuild their own futures. So for me to be able to have that opportunity um, was really, really incredible and to just meet with everybody. And um, it's why I love working for Israel Aid. It's why I'm passionate about this work. And I think why it's so meaningful for all, for all of our staff around the globe as well. Those are both such incredible stories. Um, I got me actually with yours. I'm actually based in Florida. So with a lot of the events that you're speaking about, it like really hits home when we saw um, I think actually both your organizations might have been in Florida for a few events, um, but it really just hits home because when we saw like people were there willing to help us that we wouldn't think would be there to help us, it was just very impactful. Um, and Rachel, with yours, um, empowering community is just so important. And so seeing that you guys are able to go into places and help empower the communities um, to be able to help their communities themselves is also really just fantastic work and really, really important for these situations. Um, so we actually, we work a lot with um, people in America and with college students and um, a big thing about what we do is like, um, we connect people with like what they want to see. So um, one question that we have is like, are there any ways for people to get involved with your organizations um, through volunteering or through any means um, that you have? So we can start with the same order if you guys are okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. So with Israel, uh, if you happen to be in Israel and you're 21 plus and you want to do an EMT course, we actually do provide medical courses. Um, obviously, in order to be a first responder, you must be at least an EMT. Uh, if you happen to have more than that, if you're a paramedic or a doctor, physician, a nurse, you can definitely come and try to volunteer with us if you're living in Israel. Um, in terms of short-term programs, um, that would be more like working in either the administration areas in terms of, you know, uh, logistics team and packing food supplies and equipment and medical bags. We have short-term things as well, but if you really want to try to um, be where all the action is, it's really being on the front lines, being a medic, um, which I highly recommend. I highly recommend, well, even if you're not in Israel, to definitely take a first aid course. Um, you never know when it comes in handy. And um, I think what really helps us the most is just spreading the word of our organization and the financial aspect. You know, we don't charge for any of our services, so it's really all based on donations. Um, and you can do that by going to the website, israelrescue.org uh, or israelrescue.org slash Ukraine emergency, and you can help uh, with all of our efforts in Ukraine as well. Um, but that, that's really uh, very, very helpful to us. Amazing. Rachel, how about with Israel yeah, so I think I touched on it, you know, a little bit. We've been sort of trying to find that balance between having U.S. communities engaged and also the need for professionalized uh, support. So obviously, if someone's a doctor or has specific mental health uh, backgrounds or engineering within water, sanitation, hygiene, you know, those are things that most of our volunteers um, who are deployed are focused on. So what we've really tried to do is, you know, think of new ways to engage U.S. audiences who may not be able to, um, you know, deploy with the team. We're also looking at deployments that can be upwards of a month or two months. So often if it's a professional in the U.S., there might be some challenges with them committing long term. Um, and we really want to create stability in the places we operate, because, as I mentioned, it's not just about the immediate go help out for a few days and then leave. But it's really about how do you empower the community in long term? And that takes long-term relationships with our staff members. How we've been able to, I guess, engage U.S. audiences um, is we actually do, as I mentioned, uh, U.S. deployments. I was actually part of our food bank deployments during the COVID-19 pandemic, although it's still ongoing, um, where food insecurity in the major cities were a huge issue. Um, and we have a roster of individuals, so I can you know, share the list um, to have any of you sign up. And as things come up within the US and if Israel deploys, we call on individuals who might respond to those emergencies. Obviously you have to be over 18 um, and there's some uh, 
you know, liability, you have to sign waivers and all of that, but we've done everything from muckouts and, you know, places affected by tornadoes, which means just literally cleaning out homes, you know, help putting them back together, helping individuals. Um, we've also done a lot of work with forest fires, uh, particularly faced here in California, um, where individuals who are local within, you know, who may have a background in psychology or, you know, mental health might deploy with Israel on a more short-term basis. And as Gavi mentioned, we also really awareness building and engagement with communities um, is really, really important. Uh, so the other thing that we also have is we have a program called Better Together, where a community can adopt a program that Israel operates. It might be, you know, $1,000 or $5,000, and they do community engagement and fundraising. But there is also a direct relationship between a U.S. community and one of the missions that Israel operates as well. Um, we do a variety of speaking events, B'nai Mitzvah, um, college programs as well. So there's a lot of ways to get involved and I encourage you to reach out to us. I'm happy to you know, discuss any of those if anybody's interested in learning more. Thank you both so much. So we're gonna actually open the floor to questions. If anybody has any questions, feel free, feel free to throw them in the chat below um, and you can have your questions asked. So this is your opportunity to learn more, ask the questions that you want to know. Um, I'll give everybody a few minutes to type anything they want. Also, it was really just fantastic hearing from both of you. Um, by the way, like if any of you guys are wondering, um, we do have ways for you to get involved like with these organizations through contacting them. So um, you can find them on social media through um, Israel Aid and Hatsala or through um, even our organization, which is Israel 21C. We have plenty of articles written about both these organizations um, with links to their websites. Um, so there is like there are ways for you to learn more about both of these organizations through their organizations themselves as well as through our like our organization and the stories that we write okay so we have a question so um what was the largest operation that each organization engaged in and how did you go about being a part of an event um to such a scale like such a large scale so rachel you can start with this one yeah, so this predates me starting in, at Israel, um, but we were involved in the Nepal um, earthquake, and I think that that was one of the major ones that we've done, as well as Haiti. Haiti, in terms of the length of being on the ground there. So for us, scale isn't just about how many staff members are there, but how long-term the program is. Um, and what's interesting with long-term development is that the needs will constantly be evolving. So what might be, you know, from the immediate crisis of the first few weeks to the first year may eventually evolve into something um, that looks completely different. So in the case of Nepal, we had transitioned obviously from the emergency response to then longer term mental health support. Um, but what we ended up transitioning to, which actually happens quite a bit, also working with refugee populations, is as you're in a community longer, and as communities get back onto solid footing, you know, in the recovery process, then there's future concerns such as, you know, livelihood, um, entrepreneurship, finding ways to support their families after a community has been decimated. So in the case of Nepal, we had actually gotten involved um, in some of these livelihood programs and actually helping train Nepalese um, and providing them resources to find, uh, you know, both educational and employment skills um, that they were then able to go out and sustain themselves long term. Um, we operate those programs also working with Middle Eastern refugee populations um, in Greece and Germany, um, which is also one of our massive um, campaigns that we've done long term or missions, excuse me, um, where we started obviously helping individuals as they were getting off the boats um, coming from the Middle East into the Greek, um, you know, islands and along the shores and actually helping extract them to then transitioning to current day where we're uh, focused on technology entrepreneurship programs and that sort of thing. Um, so it really, you know, depends. Obviously, I'm not speaking on one in particular, but I think that methodology of long-term support um, really is an important piece of it and can be, um, there's plenty of examples of that um, that we've operated in around the world. Fantastic, thank you for sharing. And Gabby, how about you with United Hatella? Uh, hands down, this whole Ukraine situation. I mean, never in a million years did I think we would expect you know, an organization of 6,200 people uh, to have been the last nine, 10 weeks of just dealing with this round the clock. 
on top of our everyday operations, but um, over 30 chartered flights, right? 125 medics at any given time in the field hospital, airlifted over almost 3,000 refugees to Israel, 130 plus tons of food, uh, medications, uh, humanitarian aid, over 80,000 hot meals just on Passover alone. Uh, it has just been in its own operation, almost its own organization, right? This, this uh, people don't understand the complexity. I even internally working in the organization and um, volunteering with all the calls. I do. I'm, I'm constantly in Israel. The second I get there, I'm, I'm back on one of our ambu cycles, which are medical motorcycles that respond to all the cases within three minutes or less. Um, but just the last you know, few months, and again, Ukraine is a country of 40 million people, and we're now like almost 8 million refugees, and it's still growing. There's no end in sight for this stopping anytime soon. Um, obviously, we can all pray that it does, but we need to prepare what, what are the next steps, right? And as uh, and we can't forget, there's a large Jewish population in Russia too, right? So actually lately, most of the refugees coming to Israel are not even Ukrainian, they're Russian. Um, so the whole, the whole situation is just very, very, very complicated. And um, we're doing our best as an NGO, obviously, to just be one of those organizations that's leading the medical efforts. And um, uh, every day we're learning from, from everything that's happening and see how we can improve to do better with the future. Amazing, yeah, I know all of these um, events like really were very intense and um, being there like and having these full scale operations um, is just incredible that you guys were able to accomplish this. Um, so another question that we have is, um, and you might have touched on it a little bit with your answer before about how to get involved, but um, because we work primarily with college students and for that demographic, um, do you guys have any programs or internships um, for North American college students or just college students in general? Um, Gabi, you could start with this one. Yeah, United Excella does not. Uh, it's not something that we actually have. Just because of insurance reasons and being in Israel, my ability, like you have to be in Israel if you want to be a, a volunteer medic. Um, and it just makes it, we have a lot of people, you know, contacting us, seeing how they can come to Ukraine and do things like that. But just with insurance reasons and getting them there, it was just, it was easier to just send a team from Israel and we know everybody and everyone has a walkie talkie and we all speak the same language and we're kind of all coordinated and trained, right? So it's a lot easier. Uh, in terms of college campuses, I think the best thing is if there's an event that I can come, either me or, you know, someone else, a different colleague of mine can come and just really spread the word of everything that we're doing. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago, sorry, I was in Poland. Um, I was on the border there with one of our, uh, with our team of medics. And then I actually accompanied them on one of our rescue flights back to Israel. And we had about 170 uh, refugees that we got to monitor closely medically. And there were a couple of volunteers at the airport, you know, that, that were there that were from the States that just wanted to do something. So they came and they were there to offer them, you know, food and, and, some, and some clothes. Uh, when we landed. So there was a way that we were able to put them in touch. They want, you know, people are urging to, to help, which is amazing. Um, and, and, you know, really, really speaks to such volume of just uh, bringing back, you know, all sorts of trust in humanity. And it's really a beautiful thing to see. Um, but in terms of just our organization, it's just spreading the word and, and just helping us, you know, raise more funds so we can continue to, we're doing what we're doing. And hopefully when you're old enough and hit 21, you can come volunteer for us and be a medic. Thank you, Avi. And Rachel, how about you with Israel? Any programs or internships for college mm -hmm. students? Yeah, so I would echo uh, what Gavi shared. We actually had a fellowship um, pre-COVID, and obviously COVID kind of uh, put the brakes on that. Um, but, you know, as Gavi mentioned, too, you know, I think awareness raising is really important. And I'm always inspired. I work with a lot of communities and particularly youth. Um, we had a, a young gentleman who just had his bar mitzvah and ended up raising $10,000 for Israel um, by sharing with his network and people. And for us, it's not about the money. It's about the engagement that people have, not only spreading the word, but then also feeling empowered to make a difference. And, you know, I think what's challenging in, in sort of the humanitarian aid sector is that we often equate physical presence in a place um, like volunteering is sort of the only way that we feel connected. Um, and I certainly understand that that's, you know, a way to, but what we really want to make sure is that we're serving the beneficiaries and what the beneficiaries may need may be different than necessarily what individuals have to offer. But if we can elevate their voices and the needs that they have um, and spread their stories of hope and resilience, I think that for us 
creates sort of this compounded effect. And I think there's nobody better than college students who are engaged and who are educated and who are, you know, I'm always inspired by the youth today of how much more aware of the broader world um, they are than even my generation. I'm in my 30s and, you know, it's just really, really exciting to see sort of this, this excitement from all of you. So anything that we can do to support you in terms of elevating this humanitarian aspect of our work, we always welcome and look forward to working with you on. Sorry that I was muted. Amazing. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. And thank you both Gavi and Rachel. It was so interesting hearing about the work being done by both of your organizations. Um, we loved having you and we are very interested in hearing more from you in the future and seeing the amazing work that you continue doing. Um, there are many ways for you to get involved um, in terms of contacting them for like for hearing from them um, and sharing their work. So feel free to check out Israel Aid, United Hatsala, and Israel 21C on social media or Google us, check us out on whatever platform that you want um, to keep up with the amazing work being done. Um, so both of these people are available so, um, through email, through contacting them um, with Rachel, it's rbloom at israelaid.org um, and Gavi is gavif at israelrescue.org. Um, we hope to have you guys keeping up with the amazing work that they do. Um, and you can keep up with it as mentioned on our website or our social media through Israel 21C um, or through their social medias as well, through Israel through United Hatsala or the websites, whatever platform you have, I'm sure that you can find a way to keep up with the amazing work being done. Thank you all again so much. And it was a pleasure speaking with you and this recording will go up um, as soon as we have a chance. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Really yeah, pleasure. and quickly, Shaylee and um, Alexandra, I just wanted to thank you both for putting this on. I know how much work went into this. And Gavi, I wish you and United Hatzlaha all the, the best. And I know we'll see each other in the field. So Absolutely. keep up the amazing work too. Thank you, Rachel, to you as well. And um, thank you everyone for participating and wishing everyone a meaningful uh, Independence Day happening in Israel tomorrow, right after Israel's Remembrance Day, which is about to happen uh, starting in Israel right now. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and yeah, have a good Remembrance Day and a good Independence Day. Um, and it was a pleasure speaking with you. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.